Right, so it makes life comfortable. Um, as always, this sort of time of year, take care to start up again is always going to be a little bit um, awkward. I don't know about anybody else, I'm still having to check what day of the week it is because I've lost track of that over the Christmas period. Um, and um, the other things, of course, is, you know, you get a little bit out of condition and so on and so forth. So <laughs> give yourself plenty of time to, to, to get back into the swing of things. Just rubbing your hands together. And then tapping over your face. Over your head and neck. Down to one shoulder. Isn't it? Well, I'll mute you, you all. Typical, isn't it? Forgot to mute. There you go. <laughs> This is my first Zoom class of the year, so I'll probably forget that I'm some of the important things. On the other side. Now, the upper part of your chest. Really? Right. Uh, um, anyway, I know in Tai Chi teaching one of his books, a guy called Paul Crompton mentioned that learning Tai Chi is a bit like um, learning a pair of shoes. You, you, know, you gradually fit the postures as it, as, it, as it were. And if that's true, then coming back after a break can be a little bit like uh, putting on an old pair of shoes. It would take takes a few mi minutes to, for them to sort of warm up and to, to, to soften up again. So as always, take, take your time. That, that loss of focus, plus in combination with the, you know, this probably a slightly more sedentary lifestyle, it's time to, to, to sort of overcome. Um, so Bring your attention into your body as much as you can. Maybe focus on your breathing, the rhythm of your breath, or the, the deeper breathing. Focus on things like your, your, your weight dropping back. Any sensation, anything happening within your body really is, is appropriate to focus on. Even areas that feel a bit stiff or tight or painful, though I wouldn't dwell on those, but they can be, they, they, they do draw your attention in. So. Uh, you don't want to keep thinking about a stiff shoulder or something like that, but it may be that that stiffness in the shoulder is the thing that draws you back initially in, into your body. Eventually, of course, we want to be able to, to you get a sense of movement in, in those areas, but not in the first instance. Just reminding yourself of these really basic elements that we want to stay with us all the way through the practice. And with all of that, of course, this quietening, this settling of your attention, a settling and a focusing. It's not just quietening. It's not, you know, what you may find, and this is not at all unusual, is that you drift off, you fall asleep. You suddenly sort of wake up. And you know, as I say, that's very common. And that might just mean that you needed to sleep. But that's not what we're trying to do. What we want to do is, is to come back to a, a state where we're, Settled, but, uh, but aware, alert. Now just bringing your feet in. Come to the upright position. One of my early teachers used to describe the standing posture as though you were standing on the hill looking out over a valley. I think that's quite an interesting image, you know, whether you're standing or whether you're seated. It, 
reflects both the, the sense of kind of loftiness, I suppose you could say, but also that mental attitude. It's like if you've been out for a walk or a ride or a, a, a drive or something like that, and you reach a, a viewpoint and you, you go up to the viewpoint and you the, the first thing you do is just sort of stand there and you, you kind of take it all in. So you're, you're, you're not necessarily looking for details at that point. You just want to get a sense for the overall vista. So again, a sense of being settled, but not, not, not asleep, not, not, not sort of blind to, not cut off from, from, from what's going around. If you do find that you drift off, then again, don't, don't see it as a huge mistake. It might just be that you're tired and there's nothing wrong with that. But, but two things you can do really, one is don't close your eyes, leave, leave them open and maybe even have an image of you know, that, that valley or whatever spread out be, be, before you. The other thing you can focus on is your breathing because the breathing always has a kind of fresh, freshness to it. So that, that, that may kind of raise your energy a little bit. But if you do, you know, it's not at all uncommon for people to, to, to sort of droop down in the, in, in, in the chair, but seated and standing, really, to be honest. So, you know, it might just be that you're tired. And just aware of that spacious quality, certainly you know, that image of looking over the valley, there's a sense of space around us, in front of us, but also within your body, remembering that the, the posture, you know, supported by your feet and your hips, your weight sinking down, that stronger feeling within the body will gradually allow some of the tightness and some of the stiffness that we feel in muscles and joints to release and open up a little bit, give ourselves space to move in. Just be aware that in the colder weather, that's, that's going to be a longer process to develop. Cold causes you to, to contract, so you know, take care. So just turning your head a little bit. So those things are the, the sort of background to what we're doing. And again, to take that analogy of standing on the viewpoint a bit further, you're standing there, you may focus on particular landmarks or particular details, but you don't, not, not in a tunnel visioned way, not in a closed way. You're still aware of what's around you. The broader picture, as it were. And again, going back to what I was saying about if it's an area that's tight or stiff or uncomfortable, sometimes it can be quite good to focus in on that. But if you do that too much, it becomes tunnel vision, and so it's good to come back to that broader picture. As you turn your head, just see if you can feel movement down your spine. And when the big trapezius muscle goes from the base of the skull to the lower part of the ribs, so that whole of the upper back is covered by the trapezius. That muscle is going down from the from the, the base of the skull to the, the, the front of the body as well. Hands in front of your shoulders and just listen your arms swing forwards and backwards. Don't, don't do the full circle yet. Because it might not be appropriate. It might, you know, if you're feeling a bit tight in your upper back or something like that, you might want to not just not do this the, the circling or do this a little while to loosen that tightness. If you do this, you may become more aware of what's happening in upper back, and front of the, and the chest, that opening and closing movement. We're going to use that, we're going to build on that. So if, you, if you want to, if it's appropriate, take your elbows around in a full circle if that's comfortable for you. So aware of the posture that you've got, feeling of your weight sinking down in, in particular, so you're not tempted to stiffen up in your shoulders and your upper back. Going forwards.
just moving within the space that's available to you, trusting that the movement itself will gradually open up that space. Hands down to your sides. So again, we're rotating the arms, but we're feeling the movement in chest and upper back, maybe in our sides as well. And then winding around, again, just aware, not just of your arms, but really feeling that your arms are being moved by that dialogue, by that movement between chest and upper back, the opening and the closing. That helps you just soften the movement of your arms. Back the other way. Rest your hands. Yeah. Easing forwards and pushing back. Just remind yourself that regardless of how it feels, your, your body is mostly water or three quarters water, something like that. So that actually the, the muscles, the joints, the, the bones, all, all the tissues really are effectively floating rather than what we may feel, which is this idea, you know, the sense that they're somehow stiff and locked in place. We're trying to get back to that awareness of the fluidity of the movement. Changing how we're viewing how we're moving can have a profound effect on how we do actually move. Turn a little. You'll feel this one working more in the side, so the side opposite to the way that you're moving. And again, just you know, be careful with the break and the colder weather. You know, almost certainly you won't be moving as far or as fluidly as you, you're, you're accustomed to. You will get that movement back in short order, but take care. in the other direction. And then circling around. And feel as though the spine is extended down through the chair, kind of a bit like the, um, the point of a pair of compasses, so that you're in a sense swinging from that point. The crown of your head is a bit like the pencil. That way, you get a nice smooth circle. Then back in the other direction.
back to the centre and then pull one heel up, reach out. Your knees should be a little bit bent, so it's not a kind of strained feeling. And it feels like you can just gently push your foot into the floor and then step back. So like you put your foot on the floor and just finding, you know, it's like you've stepped on something quite soft, you know, like soft mud, and you just want to find that firmer base underneath. It's good to remind ourselves of doing this, you know, it looks like we're heading for some weather where maybe a bit slippery underfoot and so on and so forth. And just, just reminding yourself, you can be a little bit surer of your, your, your footing. And then on the other side. And okay, so again, keeping all those things there in the background, hands down to your side, palms forward, and then third hold your place. Just checking whether you're still essentially moving within the parameters defined by that square that your feet and hips make. And it's not that you're totally restricted enough to your arms are outside of that. So as it, as it gets taller, the square expands out a little bit, kind of like a water tower you see dotted around the country. But the foundation is still very important. And then fisherman cast the net. And then imagine the ball behind your arms. So you're not lifting your hands, but keeping your arms in position relative to your shoulders. You're using your legs to push your shoulders back. Your hands have to follow. As they do, two things to think about. One is feeling that expansion upwards through your belly and your chest. But also watch how the elbows drop. But to start off with when we do it like this, what you may find is that it's more, it's quite a small movement. But once you particularly, particularly once you've felt that movement within the body, that expansion, that movement, that energy rising up, and you can kind of relate to that a little bit, you'll find that you will get the full movement back. But it will feel different because you won't be straining to lift your arms. As your shoulders go back, the shoulders pull on your elbows, your elbows pull on your wrists, your wrists pull on your fingers. Now, try to keep that same sense of up movement upwards through belly and chest, changing the pigeon spreads its wings. So we start to get that lovely opening and closing in, in the chest and the upper back in a very in a sort of extreme way, in a sense, very exaggerated way. So that's, that's a really good exercise for the breathing. It kind of mimics um, a, a movement that I was trained to do on people in Chinese massage. You put your hands down, people's 
and you do this, you, know, you move their elbows for them. And I was reliably informed that this was a technique you could use to help people having an acute asthma attack, which regrettably, well, I'd say we're quite good in a way, but I actually found myself having to do that, well, not having, but, but doing that on a, uh, a child who was having an unexpected asthma attack. We, we called the ambulance first, but then you know, to, to provide ease, I, I, I adapted that extra that technique and used it. And it really did seem to help. Combination of the calming rhythm and that very gentle op opening and closing can be very good for breathing. And you know, if you're interested in following that up, the best way to start is just as you go back every now and then, don't do it every time, but just see how the in-breath feels. Take a breath in. If it doesn't feel right, you go back to breath. Just let the in-breath, the out-breath come in its own time and just gradually build it up like that. We'll, we'll, we'll do the standing version of this later um, when you get a chance to compare. And when we come to pushing a wave, the same thing, I've, I've exaggerated, you can see how my elbows have gone out and then they come in. We don't want the elbows to go behind the shoulders. So particularly in the chair, but it's also true in the standing, we're quite, we can't really move the hands right back. But what we can do is let the chest open. So now we're using that energy of the chest to help to create this stronger feeling of movement. And that, that energy in the chest is very much the sort of energy that will be associated with those stronger movements. And sort of martial movements and so on and so forth. Everyday movements, really. Good, and then yeah, same thing here, but again, much more subtle. We don't want the elbows to come right behind like this. So we, the, the elbow comes back towards the hip. So it doesn't, the arm doesn't travel very much, but this spiraling movement in the arm creates a lot of movement, or this, it's created by a lot of movement in the chest and the ribs. So all of these exercises, and in some ways, particularly the smaller ones, have quite a profound resonance within chest and upper back and have an effect on our breathing. And that's important, of course, because at this time of year, with that tightness, that constriction, can be a very hard time of year for people with breathing problems, one kind or another, because the, everything tightens up, so it's harder to take the breath. So good to get a sense of just opening that area out a little bit. Okay. And it's not always the big movements that are the most effective. By making small movements, we sometimes bypass the big muscle systems work on tendon, ligament, postural muscle, fascia, that kind of thing that often get missed in other forms of exercises. So not always about the big movement, but this next exercise sort of combines the bigger and the smaller movements.
Okay, and then one more time coming back and then changing, polishing the table. Don't overdo the movement outwards. Just have a sense that you're a sense of curiosity, really. Yeah. So ask yourself, if I do this movement in my hips, how far will my hands go? Rather than thinking, this is how far my arms ought to go. One more in each direction. <clears throat> okay, now, coming back, turning your hands, palm up, pushing down, feeling that lengthening through your back, your arms following that process and then the opposite way. You may even feel a sort of tingling going up your back. If you feel that, you may notice where that gets restricted, blocked. And that's really as far as your arms should be moving. So I notice, it's quite interesting, my hands are coming up to about level with the shoulders, which is about as high as I want them to go in this exercise anyway. Class I did earlier, face-to-face -face class that I did earlier, I noticed that my hands were coming up to about here. And I noticed that there was a kind of slight stiffening feeling just you know, behind my hand in my back. It seems to have gone now, which is nice. So you know, these, these kind of observations mean that once again, we're not thinking I've got to bring the hands here. That may be a, an aspiration, um, a goal in the long term, but you have to have a sense of where you actually are. Remember, feeling that length, and as though your head is just going up, you may even see a little bit of movement, hard to tell really, in the head. So using your feet and your hips. And changing to the wild goose. Again, not straining to raise your arms or to push your hand down. And then part in the clouds, remembering that the higher, the further out your hands go, the more likely you are to reach a point of stiffness, a point where your overall posture is, is a little bit compromised. Perhaps not such an issue when we're seated. If you're standing and you, you, you move beyond that limit, that's when you might find that your stability is affected. Out in the crowd. Now for this one, change into the dragon, plucks the stars from the sky.
when we think about that idea of a return to or a kind of reconnection with the very basic qualities and principles, we can use the rhythm of the movement to help us just touch base on a regular basis to sort of define that moment of just aware of the basic ideas. And it would come here, you know, just as your hands come down, just aware of the weight of your arm for a moment before you switch to the other side. It's just a, just a, a slowing down, a, a gentle deceleration. And then change in after this one. Take your time, let your hand come down to its full length. Bring your hands around. Push up. And Next time we do the sideways movement, we'll build in the, the turning movements, the rotating movements from the hips. To begin with, just think of this as a, a rotation, an equal rotation, a movement all the way up through your body. So your shoulders just following the hips. If you find that after a little while, you know, your shoulders are moving a little bit further, then as long as you're not straining, that's fine. But again, keeping everything a soft in your body. Finishing the set with sideways push. So four movements now within this one little set. Then one foot again, knee just slightly bent, scooping the sea, looking at the sky. Be careful, it's obviously quite a strong one for the back of your leg and your back, making sure that bringing your shoulders back doesn't involve stiffening the shoulders up, but rather that feeling of your hips dropping back so somebody's pulling you back into the chair. Now here, fist your hands and come back and just make a low movement first of all, and angle forwards, bringing your hands around. So this makes it a very similar movement in lots of ways to bird folds its wings, which we do right at the start. Hands are fisted, they move a little bit more, so yeah. But it gives you the, the basic action, it reminds you of what's happening in your chest and your upper back. Then just gradually see whether you can let the hands ride up a little bit. Here they're quite low down, and they angle upwards. 
and again just as far as you're comfortable and no higher than your own ears. Sometimes referred to as twin strikes to the ears. So if the idea of looking into the tiger's eyes doesn't appeal, just think about those times you've had somebody in front of you where you've had a really strong desire to box their ears for them for some reason or another. That would be the martial application form. Not that I'm suggesting you should go around boxing people's ears, but you know what I mean. <laughs> We've all felt it, haven't we? One more time. Grasping the tiger's ear. And then on the other side. Remember that the, it's, it's quite a bold movement. Grasping the tiger's ears. Now change into um, grasping the tiger's ears, but start with the low movement and just try and get a sort of angling upwards. I'm going to show you with one hand there. This is one of those rare movements where actually here you see the hand does come behind the shoulder, and that helps with the opening of the chest, but the initial movement of the chest closing. And because the hand's quite low down to start off with, makes that feasible. And then gradually coming up until you reach up to the point just behind, just, just, just level with your ears, looking between your hands. Now in all of these movements, I mean, obviously the weight is moving and so on and so forth, but, you know, this rotation, remember that feeling of movement in your chest and your upper back. That's a connection that isn't always recognized, I think, in Tai Chi movements. But also one that is really useful, as I said, at this time of year with the, the colder weather, constricting things. You know, if you do have a respiratory issue, that can become quite become exaggerated in the colder weather. Okay, and then just bring my feet back. Just rest for a moment. When you rest your hands down, feel how heavy your arms are on, on your legs. Take a couple of slow, gentle breaths. And see if you can notice you know, with, with the breathing, can you be aware of those very small changes, you know, the little of expansion between the ribs and so on and so forth, the things that don't necessarily um, come to the surface. You know, we often would take, take a deep breath of using the pectoral muscles and things like that, but trying to get that sense of the breathing totally through the whole of the upper part of the body. Okay, and then rubbing your hands together. And tapping over your face. Over your head and neck. Shoulder. And your arm. Side. 
Billy. And your legs. And then pumping the, the foot up and down, paddling, I think it's sometimes referred to. If you're not working through your leg quite nicely, and then you push the heel up and now take your knee around in a small circle with the movement into your head. And then on the other side, pushing up and down first of all. And circling around. Okay, and then if you want to stand, just stand carefully. Remember when you stand up, you know, you may experience what is sometimes technically referred to as postural hypotension. It's a, a basically a loss of blood pressure through a change in posture um, or something to do with posture. Everybody gets it sometimes when you jump up too, too, too quickly. And in, because the heart has to suddenly start working harder to pump the blood to, to, to your head. And in the, in the few moments when, when it's trying to do that, we, sort of, we can get a bit woozy. Again, in the colder weather, your circulation is going to be more sluggish. That's more likely to happen. This is why we do the tapping exercises and things before we stand to prepare the body to, 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 to work well when it's, when, when it's standing up. Whenever you can, you know, if you've been sitting down for a while watching the television or something like that, I know it's not always possible, but just bear in mind, you know, if you can just move around a little bit, do some tapping, move, move your legs, do it in bed as well, you know, being asleep, rather than getting out of bed and kind of staggering around and being a bit groggy and wondering, wondering where the kitchen is. Give yourself a few moments just to kind of wake up properly, to let your body begin begin to move a, a, a little bit. So feet parallel, hip width apart, sinking down, and then pushing up. Again, we have that sense of just touching base at the bottom. Maybe aware of that sort of tingling movement going up the spine and then down. Movement. Somebody once described, a guy called Noah Montague described, as though somebody was just rubbing their finger or running a marble up the spine and then down again. If you do get that hypertension and the kind of wooziness that can come with that, it's not anything, you know, it's just as a one off, as I say, particularly when you've just stood up, and that is quite, it's not at all uncommon. Of course, if it does persist, then you know, it could be something to do with your blood pressure or something. Always, as always, you know, check with your GP. But one more time. And then wild goose. And then part in the clouds.
One more time. One foot forwards. Transferring your weight and thinking back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, that sense of being on the viewpoint, looking out over a landscape, both in terms of your overall posture, your outlook, but also in that sense that you're prepared to just rest and enjoy the view. So it's not forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, just taking a moment to, to reconnect to the ground and the explain. And then raising your toes and your heel. And then stepping in. And then the other side. And then raising your toes and your heel. Stepping in. And just take a few steps through. Bring your feet down. We're going to do the standing version of um, pigeon spreads its wings. And when I'm in, when I do it chair based, the arms are spreading out as I as I go back. The standing version can be done in either direction. Um, more commonly done with the weight going back as we would do in 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 the chair. But my preference, and I'll explain why. You'll see why hopefully when we do this. Is, is for doing it going forwards, which I, I think is probably an older version. You commonly find this exercise in a, a, a set called the 18 move Tai Chi Chi Gun, um, which I first came across in a pamphlet that was issued by a Shanghai bank. Right about the end of the 1980s, um, you sometimes feel, see the whole set referred to as Shibashi, um, which may actually be a, mistra a mispronunciation the Chinese characters for that would, 
would seem, I'm, I'm not great at Chinese pronunciation, but it looks to me like it's more like shibashi rather than shibashi. Shibashi sounds more Japanese to me. To, 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 to me. Um, but so you, you may have come across it. It's actually, it's actually a lovely set of movements, um, although like most sets of movements, I find a, a bit incomplete. Um, but in fact, there's, there's, there's something like eight or nine of the eight, 18 move Tai Chi Qigong sets. They were originally, the, the first one was there originally to give people a chance to do Tai Chi without having to remember a Tai Chi sequence, um, which is very good. Um, I think after that, it's become a bit, a bit of a marketing device, to, 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 to be honest. Um, but there's some nice movements in, in all of them, but there's always a lot of interchange, I think, between different sets. So th this version of it, I, um, I, I came across before, I came across the, the 18 move or Shibashi set. Um, so I, I do it with the, with the weight going forward. So start with the weight in the back foot. Press your hands on your belly. And the reasons I like to do it like this is because now the forward movement of my body and you know, the, the intent of the energy matches the direction of, of my arm. So as you move forward, just imagine there's a, like a, a balloon in, in your belly that just expands a bit and begins to push your hands out a little bit and then it contracts and draws them in. I don't know how easily yeah, you can begin to see that. So there, and I'm exaggerating this, I'm going to come a bit closer, but notice, notice how my elbows get pushed out. That's, as I say, I am exaggerating, but what happens is, as you go forward, the hands get pushed forwards, the elbows separate, and they draw your hands out, and then the elbows come in. Now, so, if you're doing it in the chair, it's better to do it the other way around, because you're coming back to the upright position rather than angling forwards. But to, to get the, the benefit of that opening of the chest without straining, actually, if, if, if standing you do it going forwards, somehow feels a more complete movement to me. But again, it's that rising up, belly, solar plexus, chest, matching the rhythm of the breathing, the, the, the pathway of your breathing. Which means that again, if you, if you like the idea of doing this, if it's comfortable, I mean, and then just see what it's like to take a breath in as you go forwards and open up. The pigeon spreads its wings. And then on the other side. So sometimes referred to as the dub, actually. I've come across people calling it the dub. I think probably because they, they had something against the idea of a pigeon. Perhaps pigeon is too common an image, but there isn't really any difference from a morphological point of view. And personally, I'm rather fond of pigeons, so I'm going to stick with pigeon spread this way. So going forward, just resting your hands on your belly, feeling how your body's moving your arms, of course, and gradually just letting the movement build with an expansion in your belly, moving up towards your waist, your solar plexus, and just in your own time, reaching the chest and your lungs. Now, feedback I've had from people suggests that this is actually quite a nice movement that people have found helpful for their breathing. One more time. So pigeons spread this way. Cuckoo noises are optional, I think, when you're doing that. <laughs> so. Once again, just 
Mind in your posture. In your arms hanging down, just feel that full weight of your arms for a moment. And it's not necessarily comfortable because it pulls your shoulders down. And you see, when I sit like this, my shoulders are sloping down, but we spend a lot of time with our shoulders like that. So that can create a feeling of pulling to start off within the shoulders. It will, it will pass if you practice it. And then embrace tiger, return to mountain. And again, not rushing, not in a hurry. And so just for a moment at the bottom of the movement here, you'll wear that full weight of your arms. And then the response from your shoulders is to begin to contract. And the response from your legs and your hips is to push up. So if we wait, then the beginning of the cycle comes quite naturally again. The expansion comes naturally. So in terms of Chinese sort of energetics, the yin element, the, 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 the quieting element, quite naturally sets up the potential for the yang and the yang inevitably becomes the yin. And rest. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. Well done. Hopefully, that's helping to start the year a little bit. So, take care. Thank you. Especially if it does get a bit slippery out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. I'm sure.